we were treating AML with 7 and 3 in 1977. We are still doing the same in 2018. What is the best way forward to change this by 2028? Well, I think um, one idea that's become quite clear, particularly in AML, is that um, we need to find the biology more deeply. We don't understand how, fundamentally don't understand what drives these cells. Um, you know, the, the uh, surprising story with uh, at least myeloid leuke leukemias was that when the cancer genomes were being sequenced, uh, there was this simple idea that we would sequence all these cancer genomes and all the genes that would fall out would be genes that controlled cell growth. So there would be very, it would be a quite a simple kind of answer. Um, it turns out, as, as you know very well, in AML, the most commonly mutated genes, we still don't understand why they, how they contribute to the malignancy. Uh, you know, genes like TET2 and DNMT3A, these are genes that have to do with the methylation of DNA, the demethylation of DNA. How does that make a cell become completely unable to stop dividing? So one aspect of that is to concentrate on the fundamental biology of the disease. But as you know very well, and this is what I've spent most of my life thinking about, that is just the half the picture. That is the yin in the yin and the yang. The yang is the microenvironment. Why does AML live in the bone marrow? Uh, what, is, what about this disease? And how do we alter that microenvironment uh, using, immune, using the immune system, using cellular components of the body, using normal parts of uh, human physiology? Uh, how do we alter that environment to now attack it, the disease? So in, if you were to ask me in 2019, you know, what will really be a, a landmark study in AML? I would say somehow combining the yin and yang, somehow combining our capacity to understand the biology and target the disease using targeted therapy, some kind of medicine, medicine that really shuts off this uh, abnormal growth, uh, like a, you know, hopefully like in, without uh, side effects, but at the same time concentrate on the microenvironment, find out why it is in that certain places, AML doesn't grow in your nose, it doesn't grow, you know, interestingly, doesn't tend to grow typically even in the brain. Uh, you know, but on the other hand, other leukemias migrate so quickly there to the brain. So they're very, very seed and, important seed and soil questions. And I think we have to tackle both the seed and the soil uh, for AML in 2019. That's the kind of study that I look forward to, combining a powerful immunological arm with a, uh, with a medicine. Excellent. And you certainly have done so much to contribute towards the microenvironment studies. Thanks. Uh, my second question is that three and a half million papers have been published in cancer. 135,000 in 2017 alone. There's a staggering disconnect between great scientific insights and translation into improved therapies. What are we doing wrong? Well, I think that I think part of what we're doing wrong is um, the cancer therapy. I think appropriately is built like a pyramid. The bottom of the pyramid is cancer prevention. The intermediate layer of the pyramid is the early detection of cancer, and the top of the pyramid is the treatment uh, of cancer. Now, obviously, as as you you know, um, a lot of attention focuses on the top of the pyramid because that's when patients come to see you. They want to be treated for a disease that they have. Meanwhile, cancer prevention is a much much more difficult, in some ways, puzzle to crack, because um, because uh, you know you're trying to prevent a disease that doesn't exist. You're trying to prevent it from existing in the first place. Um, but that is the appropriate way that the pyramid should be set up fundamentally. Now. For the longest time, we thought that exploring the treatment paradigms would somehow flow backwards and allow us to detect early and also allow us to prevent cancer. And that's happened to some extent, but it hasn't happened to the extent that we really, really want it to happen. Um, that's part of the reason that we, I think, what, we've, what we're doing wrong is we were trying to use the treatment paradigm to try to understand early detection and to try to understand uh, cancer prevention. But as we move forward, I think they, 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 we really need to integrate these three pieces together. Um, again, going back to what the thing that I'm obsessed with, uh, the microenvironment, the body's states, the immunological state of the body, um, that could be very important in cancer prevention. You see, we could understand how cancers only grow in certain individuals, but not in under, uh, other individuals, and we could change the physiology, hopefully, 
uh, to prevent cancer in a way that's much more tractable. On the other hand, what's, what's, what's been surprising and somewhat disappointing is that the concentration on treatment, particularly the kind of monomaniacal concentration on cancer genomics, has really not told us very much about how to prevent cancer in the most of the most of the people. It has not informed in the way we had hoped how to prevent cancer. So we need to rebuild this pyramid, uh, as it were, from scratch, understand the contributors of the pyramid, understand that we need something, um, some deeper understanding of the host physiology, the environment of the host, the microenvironment of the host, the behavior of the host that makes them susceptible or not susceptible to cancer. I'm not, I'm not dinging the cancer ge genome, I'm not dinging cancer genomics, I'm just saying again that there's a yin and yang quality about it. We focus monomaniacally on one aspect of the puzzle, but we haven't been able to integrate down to the bottom where the real sort of gain would lie. That's great. Third question. Fact that children respond to the same treatment better than adults seems to suggest that cancer biology is different. But also, of course, the host is different, what you're talking about, the microenvironment. But since most cancers increase with age, even having good therapy may not matter because the host is decrepit. What's your solution? Well, so, I mean, you're, you're preaching to, I mean, I, I, this has been sort of the center of what I've thought about for a long time. I think, uh, again, if the host is decrepit, then our capacity to understand how to treat cancer has to change because we have to take into consideration the host. This is a classical seed and soil problem. This is a classical problem in which you, if you focus monomaniacally on the seed and forget the soil, you will not understand the real dynamics of what is happening. What's interesting is, in fact, if you look at some tumors, not all tumors, if you look at tumors, the mutations that are found in children are very similar to the mutations found in adults. That's not true for all tumors. There's some unique ones that are in children. And yet the, the same tumors with the same sort of mutational spectrum do, ver do relatively better in children and relatively worse in adults, yet I'm again suggesting that there are two aspects to this, to this puzzle. Um, I think that uh, the solution out of this is to, again, give deep consideration to what the host is. What does the biology of the host look like? Um, what are the factors in the host that contribute towards or against the development of cancers? Why do some hosts, I mean, it's an interesting question, why do some hosts, if you look, you can find cancers in their body, but they haven't become uh, what we would call, uh, you know, invasive or malignant or, or, or the kinds of cancers that will kill you. Um, some people seem to have a capacity to keep cancers at bay. We, we know this from a, a whole history of autopsy studies. What is it about them? What is it about those people? So yet again, I mean, you know, it's, it's the same questions keep coming up in 2019. And I think they're coming up for a reason. They're coming up for a reason because we have solved to some extent one part of the puzzle, the cancer genetics puzzle, not fully, solved to some extent the cancer genetics puzzle, but we haven't solved the host puzzle. We haven't solved the microenvironment puzzle. And we haven't solved how to take these two factors together and develop new lines of therapy going away from this 7 plus 3 as we move into the future. That's the problem, I think. Excellent. Uh, next question. You have great knowledge and experience in this field. If you were given limitless resources, how would you plan to cure cancer? What would you do? Well, I would go back to this pyramid. I would go back to the, this, this idea that we need to relearn um, how to think about this scheme in terms of prevention, detection, and, uh, and treatment. And we need to integrate these. We need to figure out how the, the, what we've learned about cancer treatment thus far can be translated into early detection and can be translated in, into prevention and, and take very seriously the problems that lie in the bottom two layers. So just to talk about early detection, we are now at a phase where we can have powerful ways to uh, look at uh, host uh, blood to see whether uh, genes that are associated with cancer are, have spilled out into the blood. Can we then find those cancers? These are powerful technologies. What we don't know is whether we can find the cancers that are likely to kill you or we'll just find lots and lots of cancers and just you know, overdiagnose people and end up uh, you know, doing invasive things on people that actually don't deserve uh, any of that. So that's a, it's a big puzzle in the early detection field. The, the big puzzle in the prevention field is that although we've looked uh, a lot, we haven't been able to find a whole host 
of preventable chemical carcinogens or removable chemical carcinogens since the 1980s or 1990s. I mean, such as cigarette smoke, which is clearly a carcinogen. So, uh, you know, we found, what we have found rather is either many, many carcinogens with small effects, um, yeah, you know, and there are many examples of this, or we are now beginning to find physiological states, body states, host states that are uh, more inclined or less inclined to develop cancer, even host genetic states that are more inclined or less inclined to develop cancer. So I think in prevention, we have, we, we're starting to move away from this hunt for, you know, this mysterious carcinogen that we hope to find, or series of carcinogens that we hope, hope to find and remove from the environment towards trying to understand more deeply about what causes cancer, how much of it is random, error, how much of it is intrinsically built into cellular division, errors of cell division. And um, I think this is going to be an er area that, we, that you know, everyone will focus on. Host metabolism, host genomics, uh, the, as I said before, the environment, the microenvironment, the immune system, the behavior of the host, the exposures that happen, how to take all of this together and build a more um, a robust platform for cancer prevention. Excellent. Last question. Offering patients with advanced stage non-curable cancer palliative but toxic treatments, is it a service or a disservice in the current therapeutic landscape? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's a it's a complex blessing, and and, and to, to understand that uh, complexity, to know a little bit about the history of cancer. I mean, it is certainly true that we 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 should and have backed away as a community from offering toxic therapies uh, to patients who actually won't are unlikely to benefit from those toxic therapies. The the plea, on the other hand, is to remember that this that that the road to progress in many cancers was furrowed by extraordinarily toxic trials, extraordinarily difficult trials, and each one of them taught us something. So my, my general plea is that if we're going to offer these kinds of therapies, um, that we do it in a mode that, we, that we're also learning something about the future. If we're doing this just to satisfy ourselves, that's the, as doctors, just to palliate ourselves as doctors, that is the, that is the lowest uh, of the low uh, goals. Um, certainly, if it gives the patients hope, um, you know, I think there's, there's a reason, but that's a conversation you need to have with someone, and it's a very honest conversation. Oncologists often run away from that conversation, doctors run away from that conversation, but you need to have it. But my general plea is that we sh if we do is this, the only way that we would do this is to learn something from the process, so that the, in the next iteration, it moves a little bit more towards something more powerfully therapeutic. Um, and that has happened in the history of cancer. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.